We have been uh, discussing noise models. We looked at the noise model of the MOS transistor and that of the resistor. And you can have other components also with noise like a diode or a bipolar transistor and so on. The noise model will be given. Like I said, what it means is that there is some current that is predicted by the IV characteristic of the element such as Ohm's law for the resistor or the square law for the MOS transistor. But in addition to that, there is a random component of current whose value at any instant cannot be uh, predicted exactly, but whose statistics can be predicted, okay, whose statistics are known. Now, <coughs> we will be considering mostly only white noise, that is uh, noise which has spectral density at all frequencies. It turns out that uh, this happens because of uh, random thermal motion of uh, electrons and the randomness increases with uh, temperature. That is why you have the proportionality constant T, absolute temperature in the expressions for spectral density. Okay? So, both the resistor and the MOS transistor have this and we have seen the expressions for that. And in both cases, the noise can be represented by a current source in parallel with the element. Okay? So, we saw that, that gives you the noise spectral density. Now, in a circuit you have a number of components. So, how do you calculate the noise? You define some quantity as the output, you calculate the transfer function from every noise source to that output. Okay? Uh, then the contribution of that element is the spectral density of that element times the magnitude square of the spectral density. Okay? Now, you add up all of these things. <coughs> now, the noise from uh, different physically different components are necessarily uncorrelated. So, you can just add the spectral densities. Okay? If there is correlation between noise, you have to add it more carefully, but at least again we would not be considering such cases. So, uh, in our case you have like physically different components, so you just add spectral densities. Now, uh, what you do after uh, evaluating the spectral densities that essentially tells you everything about the noise at let us say a voltage between a particular pair of nodes or a current through a branch. Now, in many cases you need to calculate the variance of uh, the noise. We, uh, we will see uh, soon that that is what uh, determines the bit error rate in our communication system. So, to calculate the variance of noise, you have to integrate the spectral density from 0 to infinity. Okay? We are talking about one sided spectral density. If you evaluate the integral from 0 to infinity, that gives you the variance or the mean square value. This, of course, is always true. So, in our case, we have either voltage or current. So, we will have uh, uh, the variance in either volt square or ampere square or you can take the square root of it and express the root mean square value in volts or amperes. Okay? So, we did a, an example calculation with a very simple case where you have a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. The noise spectral density turns out to be low pass right? and the noise variance happens to be k dy c which is a fundamental result and something that you should know. Okay? Any questions about any of this? Now, so uh, the way we will uh, uh, do this is to calculate the variance and from there calculate the bit error rate if necessary. Okay? And that is uh, if uh, required to if we are required to calculate the bit error rate for our communication systems. Then uh, there is one more concept that I introduced that of input referred noise. When you have this is a very large noise. I think I need to maybe try to increase the signal to noise ratio, but that is also a problem. So, uh, 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 the concept of the input referred noise that is we have a system with an input source and some output. This is always uh, most of the times this is what we have, right? some system that takes an input and gives out an output. Now, uh, we refer the noise source to the input. What this means is that you assume that somehow the circuit has become noiseless magically and there is a single noise source at the input which uh, then gives you the exact same noise at the, at the output as the original noiseless circuit. Okay? Now, to calculate this you have to calculate the output noise, calculate the transfer function from input to the output and divide the output noise by the square root of the transfer function, magnitude square of the transfer function. I also said that this representation by a single source is not always valid. Okay? If you are driving a, a circuit by an ideal voltage source, then you can represent the noise 
by also by a voltage source. If you are driving a circuit by an ideal current source, then you can represent the noise by a current source. But if you are driving a circuit by an arbitrary source, that is some uh, voltage source in series with some impedance or current source in parallel with some impedance, you have to use both the input referred noise current and the input referred noise voltage sources. Okay? Otherwise, you will get uh, wrong answers. Now, that is fine, that can be done, but uh, these two sources are also not uncorrelated because I mean this you kind of expect because both sources are result of the same noise sources within the circuit, right. There are some noise sources within the circuit, it is the same sources that contribute to both the input referred voltage noise and the input referred current noise. So, they will be correlated, so that makes the calculations more com complicated. If we ever encounter such a case where we have to calculate the input referred noise when we do not have uh, either 0 impedance or infinite impedance, we will come to that. Otherwise, we will just use one of the two, either input referred current noise or input referred voltage noise depending on the type of input that we have. Okay? Now, did we, so we analyze the circuit, we know that V naught by V i is 1 plus 1 by 1 plus S R C and we also know that the output noise spectral density is 4 k d r 1 by 1 plus 4 pi square f square c square r square. Okay. Now, if I had to represent the noise of this uh, whole circuit using a voltage source at the input, because the input is a voltage source, I also have to use a voltage source here. What will be the spectral density of this? How will you calculate that? Huh? And then? Yeah, so tell me what the answer is. What is it? It is 4 k d r. I mean, in this case, it is quite obvious because first of all, we have only one noisy component, and if we happen to represent the noise of the resistor by a source that is in the same place as the input referred noise, we do not have to calculate anything, but I am just showing it to you. So, it is S V O divided by V naught by V i square, which is 4 k t r. Okay. This is just an example calculation, but that is what we have. Okay. Now, it is quite common to uh, express uh, noise of uh, some circuit using the input referred noise for lots of cases. Okay. Op amps, you look at an op amp data sheet, you will have the input referred noise and so on. Okay. The reason is, I mean you do not want to always go into the internal details of everything. Okay. As you abstract out everything, like for instance, you do not always analyze a circuit, you just evaluate the transfer function. And after that, if you are only accessing the input and output, you just use the transfer function. You do not go into what is inside the circuit. Similarly, here also, once you abstract out the entire circuit of the black box, you can refer to only the input referred noise and not look at individual noise sources in the circuit. Okay? So, now that we know how to make some basic calculations with noise, there will be more examples in the problem sets. Let us see how uh, it relates to our communication system. Okay. So, I said that we have a transmitter, some channel, I will call it H C H to denote the channel. I will denote it as a black box with some transfer function. Okay. And then we have the receiver. What is inside a receiver? We have a decision circuit okay and there is a clock this means that at the rising edge of the clock you take the samples and make a decision okay this is what is inside a this is what is a receiver okay now there may be other circuits i mean there is a comparator there may be other amplifiers and many other circuits 
within the receiver. Let us not go into those details now. Basically, there is some decision making circuit. Okay. The essential function of that is to sample the input at some T s that is every T s it just takes the sample. Do not think of it as a track and hold or a switch or something. I am assuming that. So, if this is some y of t here you get y of n t s okay, and then you make the decisions on y of n t s. Okay. This is supposed to be equivalent to this whole thing. right? Now, where does the noise come in? Let us club, let us represent the noise of the entire receiver or from everywhere in the at the input of the receiver. Okay. So, that means that I have some noise here. Okay. Remember up to this point everything is continuous time, after that it is sampled, but we also saw if uh, y of t has a certain variance, what is the variance of y of n t s? Hmm? What is the variance of y of n t s? Same, I mean this makes sense right, at least if you imagine that the ensemble average is the same as time average, then this is pretty obvious. Okay. <coughs> or in some cases you may have to look at the sampling phase and then calculate the variance at that particular phase. <coughs> so, then we have the channel and the now this noise will invariably assume this to be Gaussian with some variance sigma v n square, okay. some finite variance. So, that means that this is white noise which has already been band limited, okay. because white noise if you assume that the spectral density is constant from 0 to infinity, what will be the variance? Also infinity, okay. but uh, that is not what we are looking at. Inside the circuit there will always be some band limiting, we have calculated all of that v n is a result of those calculations. Okay. Now, first let us uh, imagine that the transmitter is ideal, the channel is ideal which means that it is just a wire and we have v n which is sampled at uh, the uh, resulting sum of uh, y and v n is sampled at T s and given to a decision making block and we can assume that the decisions are binary uh, that is the simplest case. Okay. Now, without noise of course, so let us say the transmitter was putting out binary symbols like this, this is T s and this sampling here is at the positive edge of the clock. Okay. So, it is looking at the value there and there okay. and this is 0 and 1, it means that uh, I am considering a symmetric case where this is either plus V p or minus V p some voltage I transmit plus V p for uh, 1 and minus V p for 0 okay. and I sample it. Now, the phase of the sampling can change, okay. we will see the effect of that as well. So, for instance it could be now uh, as you can see I have adjusted this to be exactly in the middle of the symbol interval, okay. but the sampling event could be later or earlier depending on some circuit imperfections. We will see the effect of that also. Now, the question is what will be the uh, of course, if there is no noise then what will be these symbols. So, let us say these are uh, 
x of n what will be these if there is no noise eh? it will be exactly the same right because <coughs> there is no noise at uh, these points you the comparator will say it is positive and decode it as 1 and at these points it will uh, interpret it as it will uh, decode it correctly as a negative uh, number and the result will be a symbol 0. So, there will be no beta rate at all ok. Of course, in reality there is noise that is given by V n ok and let us say that has some variance sigma V n square ok. How will you evaluate the bit error rate? Can you do that? Have you done this calculation before? How would you do this? Will there be bit errors? I mean, will there be bit errors just because you add noise? Why? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So, the point is let us assume that this comparator is perfect. That is, if the input voltage is even slightly positive, it will tell you that it is 1, and if it is even slightly negative, it will tell you that it is 0. So, now what are we looking for? Error is, is when input is a 1 and the output is a 0 or vice versa right input is a 0 and output is a 1 ok. Now, when the input is 1 let us evaluate this case what is the value of y? Huh? Plus V p ok <coughs> V p and this is what you make the decision on right. Of course, at the sampling instant. Now, what should this be for the for you to have a bit error less than 0 ok. This is when the input is uh, 1 and output is 0 alternatively for this case minus V p plus V n is more than 0 ok. So, essentially you have to find the probability of uh, V n less than sorry probability of uh, V n to be less than what minus V p. So, V p V n is more negative than minus V p. So, then it will pull down a positive symbol to a negative symbol ok and <coughs> or sorry or for this case it is probability of V n greater than V p ok. And when does this apply and when does that apply? When does the first one apply? So, <coughs> this is the probability of error when the input is 1, this is the probability of error when the input is 0. So, what is the total probability of error? Average, what kind of average? Ok, let us say in general they are not. Yeah. So, basically you will get this with a fraction of probability of 1 plus probability of 0. Yeah, it is the average, basically it is the expected value, right, weighted by the probability. Okay. Now, I am just showing this now, but by and large we will assume that the binary symbols are equally probable. Okay. So, it will be half and half. I will just first show pictures with uh, unequal things, but So, here I will plot the probability density function of V n by itself. Okay.
it will be some Gaussian with some sigma. Okay. Sigma is somewhere here on that side. Now, what will be the probability density function of V p plus V m? What will be the probability density function of V p plus V m? Shifted by V p because V p is just a fixed number, right. So, the likelihood of V p plus V n being equal to V p is the same as likelihood of V n being 0. So, the whole thing is shifted by that much. Okay. So, this is V p, it is centered over there. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, then similarly minus V p plus V n, it will get shifted to the other side. Okay. Now, what is it that we are looking for? This thing will spill over to the positive side, the other one will spill over to the negative side. So, the area under the positive side of uh, minus V p plus V n or the area under the negative side of uh, V p plus V n, those are the probabilities of error and that we have to weight with the probability of each bit by themselves. Okay. By the way, if we send plus minus V p, but the probabilities of bits are not equal. Okay, we should in fact not be thresholding at zero, right? You understand? Meaning, I said that if uh, this value is more than zero, I'll call it uh, one. If it is less than zero, I'll call it minus one. That is the optimal case only if the probabilities of zeros and ones are equal. Okay. In fact, if the probability of one is let's say 99 percent, the probability of zero is uh, one percent, then where should the which way should the decision be? In fact, you should make it so that most of the time you say the answer is 1, right. I mean, this is exactly what you would do in the exam, right. If you think that the probability of this answer is 99 percent, then that is 1 percent, even if you are not able to solve. In fact, you would not even try to solve. If it is 99 and 1, you will just say this is the answer. So, here also, if the <coughs> probabilities are indeed like that, so the probability of minus 1 is very small, and probability of uh, 1 is uh, very large. The way to choose it is you choose something so that the area under this and the area under that are the same. Okay, the are the total area is minimum. Okay, but anyway, we will consider equi probable symbols. So our threshold will be at zero. So we are looking at so if we have this Gaussian. This Gaussian, a part of it spills over to the positive side, the area under that, and I got this Gaussian, a part of it spills over to the negative side, the area under that one. And because it is equally probable. You can just look at one of them because it will be symmetrical, right? The Gaussian is a symmetric distribution, and that area is fine. Okay, so this uh, distribution has is uh, given by this expression. <coughs> is this correct? Is that the expression for the Gaussian distribution? Scaling factors, everything is fine. Eh? Yeah, yeah, that is for this one. This is, uh, Vn does have mean zero. Okay, we assume that the noise has zero mean. Okay. So now, what is the expression for uh, probability of error? Tell me. What is it? Please evaluate it.
Now let us assume that p of 1 and p of 0 are both half. Q of AP by sigma, what is Q? Yeah, what is that? Zero to x. So, first of all, if I just write this as an integral, okay, just use this expression and tell me what the answer should be. No, no, I just want I mean I have this expression right use this expression and tell me or even you can simply use this and tell me what is it that we are looking for. <coughs> hmm? Minus? Minus infinity to 0. Okay. Huh. It is symmetric, so which one is it? So, okay, let us use the earlier one that you said with different probabilities. It is p of 1 times what integral? It is the probability of simple 1 times what? Yeah, in this case, we want the noise to be somewhere between minus infinity and minus v p, okay. p v n of v n with respect to v n plus probability of 0 in this case if uh, the noise is anywhere between v p and infinity you get an error. So, that is p v n of v n d v n. Okay. So, now if it is uh, if p of 1 and p of 0 are both half. Okay. So, what is it? It is basically half of uh, this area plus half of that area and also it is a Gaussian distribution. So, this is the same as that. So, I can take any one of these and that will be my better rate. Is this correct? If it is, uh, <coughs> is it okay or no? It is right. So, probability of error is integral of v p to infinity. Remember, this means that this you have to be careful. Uh, we have assumed that transmitted symbols are plus minus v p. Well, who knows in some problems it may be plus minus v p by 2 or something. I mean just make sure that you take the right scaling. Integral exponential ok. Now, because this appears so often in uh, communication systems, this integral cannot be written in closed form. Uh, there is a function, the normalized function, which is defined for it, which is called the q function. What is q of x? It is basically 1 over square root 2 pi uh, from x to infinity exponential minus y square by 2 d y. Is this correct? So, how do you get uh, this probability of error? What normalization should I use? So, y should be what? V n by sigma V n. Okay. So, this becomes exponential minus y square by 2 and this becomes what? Yeah. So, this is d y times sigma V n right? and the limit will become no, V p by sigma V n right, yes or no and then outside you have 1 over 
this goes with that. So, basically the result is q of v p by sigma v n. Okay. Does the result make sense? <coughs> so, first of all what happens to q function as its argument increases? If x increases what happens to q of x? It falls. Okay. So, what is q of 0? Half that is the worst case for beta rate right. I mean it is not 1 you understand that right. So, if you have beta rate of 1 it is actually very good if you know that you just invert all the bits and you have beta rate of 0. So, beta rate of half is the worst ok. So, q of 0 which means that you have no signal you are just making a decision on the noise that is you do not send anything maybe you think you are sending something and then there is noise and then the comparator is like flipping back and forth based on noise. So, then it gives you half the time it will be correct right because there is no correlation between what you are sending it and what is being uh, received, but that is no good. Now, in this case you see v p by sigma v n in fact, the argument is directly proportional to v p how strong your signal is and inversely proportional to sigma v n how strong your noise is ok that is how it should be ok. Now, I do not remember the numbers, but I think uh, q of uh, 6 is it 10 to the minus 12? Do any of you happen to remember this? I think so. But anyway, I will check this, but you can see. Now, if you plot this, <coughs> q of x versus x, it starts with half. And if you plot this on a log scale, which is typically how it is plotted, it will do this and it will drop off quite rapidly. Okay. In fact, for large x, I think there is some approximate expression also, closed form expression for that integral. Okay. I think q of 6 is 10 to the minus 12, but I will check this. Okay. Do you have a calculator which gives you q or you have internet to the access to the internet? Okay. What is the approximation? Half exponential minus x square. This is the approximation to what? The q function. Q function. Okay. So exponential minus 36, which is the same as 10 to the 36 divided by 2.7. 2.3 yeah 2.303 okay is this okay 36 by 2 is uh, would be 18 36 by 3 would be 12 so maybe this is about 15 right yeah maybe 6 is 10 to the minus 15 anyway i will also verify this just check okay <coughs> So, this times uh, 6 is oh sorry this is actually something is off here right? I have to I have to check these numbers let me do that either this approximate expression is not quite correct or uh, or some scaling factor is missing somewhere. Yeah I know I think for large x right? I think it is for large x anyway let us see ok. So, do not uh, take this number for now. I will uh, check that and get back to you. So, you have to have a certain minimum x that is uh, v p by sigma n has to be greater than something for you to have bitter rate less than something. Okay. So, that is the I mean that is the challenge okay. and you can see as you will see if you have to reduce bitter rate you have to either increase v p you end up uh, spending more power in doing that or you have to reduce uh, sigma n which also ends up uh, burning more power ok. Maybe not directly, but at least earlier you saw that for instance to have uh, smaller voltage noise you have to have smaller uh, resistances. If you have smaller resistances in your circuit your bias currents and signal currents will all be larger and you will consume more power ok. There are of course, lots of other things which contribute noise which we will see ok. So, you have to have V p that is uh, more than some ok.
Now, it turns out that, uh, so you will have I mean depending on the value of V p and sigma V n, you have some better right. Okay, there are lots of things that can eat into this uh, budget. So, first of all let us assume that the receiver has an offset. I think you are familiar with op amp offsets and so on. So, what it says is that or I mean you can think of it as offset in the comparator. That means, the comparator is not thresholding exactly at 0, but at some offset. Okay. Right. So, what will happen now to the better rate? What will be the better rate? What is the expression for better rate now? Earlier it was p of 1 times p of v n less than minus v p okay, plus p of 0 times probability of v n greater than minus sorry plus v p. Okay. So, what will it be now? V n plus V offset, yeah. So, basically we got V offset here. So, if you assume V n plus V offset is what is going into the comparator. So, this will be V n less than minus V p minus V offset plus P of 0 times P of V n greater than V p minus V offset. Okay. So, one of the probabilities reduces the other one increases which is what you expect okay because if there is an offset it will skew the decisions to one side okay so let's not worry about adding all these probabilities let's take the worst case of the two which is that which is the worst case i mean depends on whether v of is positive or negative but let's assume v of is positive which is the higher bitter rate this one okay so p of uh, vn greater than V p minus V offset. Okay. So, you can evaluate it clearly I mean depends on. <coughs> so, let us say this was originally your V p by sigma V m. Now, this point is V p minus V offset by sigma V m. Okay. So, and this thing is on a log scale and is dropping off quite rapidly. So, the better rate can be ruined quite a bit because of offset. Okay. So, there are other errors also. So, later we will see I mean you have your signal and you have other signals which can cross talk which can interfere with yours that will contribute to uh, reduce signal to noise ratio and so on. Okay, this is one of them. So, finally, we have to take into account everything. Now, finally, there is one more uh, fundamental thing that we have to see. which is also important. So, this one. So, let me show only the comparator picture. I think it is enough if I show this. So, here I have the transmitted signal plus noise and this is sampling at this is a clock and it is supposed to be sampling first of all in the <coughs> middle that is if uh, y is like this clock is supposed to be okay Now, it turns out that these positions of these clocks right, they are also not exactly periodic. Okay. Noise occurs not only in voltage, but also in the positioning of the clock. Okay. So, for now again we will not go into the details of this later we will go over to that when we see some details of the VCO, but just imagine that if you calculate the actual position of the clock 
that is the actual instant of the rising edge of the clock and comparing it compare it to the ideal values. Ideally, if uh, this is 0, the next one should be at T s, 2 T s, 3 T s, 4 T s and so on. So, it should be exactly periodic, but if you compare it to these ideal positions, the actual positions will also have a random distribution. Okay. And this is the distribution of the position of the clock, clock heads and that will also be a Gaussian okay. and it will have some I will call it sigma j we will assume that that is also exactly Gaussian with some uh, standard deviation sigma j and this phenomenon of uh, the clock heads randomly being either before or after the ideal instant that is known as clock jitter. Okay. The origin of everything is the same right. Finally, we have noise in components in resistors and MOS transistors and so on. So, you make an oscillator with ideal L c and no I mean noiseless components these clock edges will be exactly periodic, but once you have noise in the components okay, it is not just that uh, there will be some <coughs> noise added to that, but in the position of the clocks in the position of 0 crossings there will also be noise. Okay. So, that is known as jitter right. Now, the spectral density of this will be given to you later when we study VCOs we will also see how to at least how they look like if not the details of calculation, but this is there. Okay. So, what is the result of this? Is this okay? will this cause bit errors? There might be why? Yeah. So basically, in the extreme case, what can happen is, I mean, right now we are still considering ideal transmitted signals, right? So noise also. What happened was, if the noise was anywhere from here to here, it didn't affect the symbol. But when it crossed plus or minus V p it affected it. Similarly, this one this can move to the left or right, okay. but once it crosses the bit boundary it can cause a bit error. Okay. When does it cause a bit error? If the adjacent bit is different from this bit. Okay. So, what is the probability of error because of this alone forget V n forget the added noise. What is the probability of error because of this? Very small I do not know I mean the expression is what I want. No, no, what is the probability of error? Okay, that is it. Yeah. So, first at least describe to me verbally what is the probability of error when it moves to the left side and when it moves to the right side? 1 minus? Uh, yeah, if it goes outside, really? If it goes outside, it is definitely wrong. No, no, forget the expression for now. If it goes outside, is it definitely wrong? Yeah. So basically, it is probability of previous bit not equal to current bit times probability of uh, sorry I will call this tau j that is the actual jitter less than minus T s by 2 plus probability of next bit not equal to current bit times probability of the jitter being greater than T s by 2. Now, again we think uh, in this discussion the bits are uncorrelated right and independent of each other. So, what is the probability of previous bit being unequal to the current bit? Huh? What is it? If all the bits are uncorrelated what is it? And if you have coin toss right this is like coin tosses what is the probability that 
next coin toss is the same as this coin toss or a different one half right. So, <coughs> this is half and that is half. So, just like before we can take one of them and then move on and probability of uh, tau j greater than T s by 2 what is this q of T s by 2 sigma j ok. Now, just like there was a there was an offset in the comparators decision there can be an offset in the positioning of the clock also ok. In fact, that can be quite a serious error in that you imagine that you have positioned the clock exactly in the middle but it is not because of various circuit imperfections you cannot put it exactly in the middle it will have skewed to some side ok. So, let me just say that the actual clock is skewed to one side I am exaggerating the picture here, but you get the idea. So, it is skewed by that much. So, clearly it is more likely that it will cross the boundary on the left side and not on the right side, but again we will not worry about the complicated probability calculations we will just take the worst case and say that is the error. So, what will that be? What is it probability of tau j greater than? I mean do not worry about left or right it is basically T s by 2 minus T offset ok. Essentially it has smaller room to uh, drift ok. So, this will be Q of T s minus sorry T s by 2 minus T offset divided by sigma j ok which will be greater than that one ok. So, at least we now understand the sources of error. Now, you have both the voltage noise as well as jitter. So, you have to evaluate the joint distribution and do that, but typically you do not have to do that <coughs> the only one of them will be important in many cases ok, but you can evaluate it also I mean these two are independent anyway ok. These two are independent, so you can independently evaluate the error rates right. So, we will see later this will be uh, very useful first of all to specify how much noise you can tolerate ok for a certain bit of rate and this uh, the curves like this like this q function which plot here I just plotted q of x versus x, but there is a particular plot that we use always in uh, serial links to show that. Uh, so, essentially it shows as you change the clock from one edge one data transition edge to the other the bitter rate will be very large as it comes to the bindle it becomes small and as it uh, goes to the other edge it becomes large. So, that tells you something about the uh, quality of your receiver and so on ok. And similarly there is also another thing that is known as the statistical eye diagram which uh, shows you how the bitter rate is in the y direction as well ok. Essentially what we will do is one way to evaluate the link or a channel or something is imagine I mean this may be done by simulation or by actual measurement you vary both this V offset as well as T offset ok. For every value of V offset and T offset in a certain range ok. So, let us say uh, V offset less than some V max and minus V max and T offset less than T s by 2 and greater than minus T s by 2. You take all possible combinations and you make a map of the bitter rate ok. So, what do you expect if the the data transitions are like this. So, this is minus T s by 2 T s by 2 and this is V p minus V p. What do you expect? And let us say V max and minus V max I choose to be V p and minus V p. What do you expect will happen if I make the bit of red map? You see that if I get close to the edges this will be a 2 D map right. So, if I close to the edges the bit of rate will be very high right here yeah. and then as you come to the middle it becomes smaller and smaller and in the middle it will be 0. Now, the exact same map is used when the channel is lot more complicated and the received signal is not actually like this to evaluate the channel. 
now to its uh, you know the channel transfer function but it turns out that uh, it is lot harder to say things from the transfer function than from this okay so that's why people came up with this concept concept of uh, statistical i so that even before designing the receiver with some conceptual receivers and so on you can specify the channels that is you have a certain channel that is channel may be some uh, line on a pcb you say that if you use this kind of receiver it will give you this kind of performance it's quite easy to do that okay so in the next class we will look at i diagrams and the statistical i and things like that is this fine so at least conceptually if you are given uh, let us say a decision block and you calculate the noise variance somehow, you should be able to calculate the bitter rate. Similarly, uh, if you have a certain jitter, you should be able to calculate the bitter rate okay. or alternatively, if you want a certain guaranteed bitter rate, you should be able to specify either the noise or the jitter or both.